Hello, I'm really good to be here. Um, it's sort of very early for me to talk. I've never done a talk this early in the morning. I've never done a talk for 20 minutes, so I've got to be, I'm very conscious about the time. Um, I'm deaf. Uh, I am profoundly deaf. Um, so um, you're probably thinking, if I'm profoundly deaf, how come I speak? So I, I, always say to my, I always say to people that I am a deaf person that speaks very well. Um, so um, people always say to me, what do I do? Uh, you know, I don't really know what I do. Um, so I'm hoping by the end of the talk, maybe you have an idea about what I actually do, because I do so many different things. Um, so um, I'm going to... So, I went to Compton University in 1993 to study fine art. Um, <coughs> so, uh, this was uh, a painting or, or a mixed media um, that I did for an exhibition um, called Loud Dirt Not Always Clearer. Um, it really is uh, it, 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 it about a uh, discovery of my identity. Uh, it's about um, um, thinking a little bit more about uh, who I am, um, what am I doing. But I want to talk to you first before how this all came about. I was born to um, a hearing family. I was the only deaf person in uh, the hearing family. Um, but deaf was a word we did not use. So my parents decided that I am partially deaf or I have um, a, a little bit of hearing loss. I think the word deaf, it became a stigma to them. So they didn't feel that I was accepted into a deaf community. They wanted me to be adapted into um, a hearing world. Why? Because um, I think my mother decided that um, she wanted me to do whatever my brother did. My brother was hearing and she wanted me to do whatever they wanted to do. Um, I'm on Twitter or anything, I'm just reading my note. Um, <laughs> um, uh, so, um, so she decided that um, I just have to be therapy. Uh, so from the age of zero, when I, when, I, when I was zero or a couple of months, my mum decided to speak with me and get me to learn how to speak. Then from zero all the way up to probably about 18, I had to be therapy. So every week or every other week, I would learn how to speak. I can't really hear my dad speak, but I've learned how to speak. So I speak like a hearing person. I know I'm not perfect, but I speak very well. I've that down to a lot, a lot of speech therapy. Um, in school, um, when I was younger, uh, primary school, I went to what we call back then deaf unit. Uh, in the deaf unit, um, there were people like myself, all were speaking, and uh, I still believe today that's when I was the most happiest I've ever been, because I was with deaf people, and I felt a little bit of connection with them. So um, from then, I moved on to mainstream. So I went to a mainstream school, and then um, I tried to fit in with hearing people. And it was difficult because I didn't really know what was going on. But, but I was accepted with them because I spoke. I spoke quite well. Um, so in the classroom, um, we're talking like 20, 40 years ago now, and that old, 40 years ago, we didn't have the technology that we do have now. So the teacher would write something on the board, say something, I have no idea what they were talking about. So I used to mess around, that's what I did, I met around the classroom, I thought it was fun, but I never thought learning was important for me, because I didn't get it, I didn't get it. So I spent most of my um, education messing around, because I wasn't interested, I wasn't interested in the learning, but I was interested in one subject, and that was art. I loved art. And my art teacher always used to say to me, don't worry about hearing me, you don't need to hear me, just wash me. So I used to watch him and used to do his drawing in the demo or whatever, and I used to copy him. And I loved that because of the visual thing. And I didn't have to worry about any other subject. But that was great. Um, um, 
So, but outside school, I would always felt I was challenged to do a lot of things. So my mother said, well, um, why don't you try learning to play the guitar? So I learned to play the guitar. Couldn't hear it, but I still learned to play the guitar. Why don't you try and play football? Okay, I played football. I wasn't good enough because I couldn't hear them, so they put me in gold. All the crap players always go in gold, so I was one of them. Uh, why don't you go horse riding? So, so I went horse riding. I ended up breaking my chin because uh, I didn't know when you're supposed to stop galloping or something. So I did all those things. What else did I do? I went for an audition in Sherman Theatre. And um, ironically, I work for them now. So I went to the audition in Sherman Theatre, got a part, and um, only to be told that I had to mime um, the song. At that, at that point, I couldn't work out why I had to mime the song. I know now because a deaf person, I don't know the, t the pitch, the melody, or that thing. So be told to mime. So all those, all those times, I did all those things, but I never could work out why I was told that I couldn't do this, couldn't do that, or why I was rubbish and everything. Um, but I did them, you know, I did everything, I did absolutely everything, and I felt quite confident, and uh, I felt that was normal, you know, I'm accepted in the hearing community, and I felt good, you know. I never felt that um, it affected me or anything. Um, I just got on with it. Um, so I was quite protected by my family. My family always did everything for me. So they were basically my id. Um, so whatever I wanted to do something or whatever I didn't know, my mum would tell me what it was. And then I went to university. I went to university and I was the first time I was away from my parents. So uh, I realised, shit, this is a, a whole new thing for me. So I started to discover a little bit more about my identity. So about the way I can hear, what I can hear, uh, how to adapt with um, people on my own. So going to the pub, if it gets dark, when people get drunk, their mouths are all over the place and, um, and I don't know how to lip read them, because I rely on lip reading, entirely on lip reading. So it was difficult. It was really, really difficult. But yet, uh, him and people loved me. They loved me because I was fun. Um, I, I got drunk the quicket. Um, I did things, I did stupid things, only because I wanted to be part of them. I grew my hair long. I grew my hair really long because I was embarrassed of my hearing aid. It worked, because people thought I looked really sexy and really cool. But it didn't work because people, were, the girls would come up to me one year, hi, hi, what's your name, what's your name? But I had to rely on their lips because I couldn't hear them. So it was difficult. So it was about me trying to fit in uh, that society. <coughs> um, I never really told people that I was deaf because of the word that we never used. So I kind of said, yeah, I've got a hearing loss, a little bit of a hearing loss, but I'm okay, I'm cool, I can understand it. Um, I remember um, in university, I um, met um, a deaf person who did sign language. Uh, I was so embarrassed to meet him. I was really embarrassed. I thought, what the hell are you doing doing this sign language? I didn't know what sign language was. He was um, doing full sign and uh, he was trying to speak to me. I was embarrassed. I didn't want to know him. I think I'm more superior than him and uh, I just didn't want to know him at all. And, uh, and I felt that ah, that's not me even though I probably was, at the time, more deaf than he was. Um, uh, so, I got through university. Um, you know, I did like well, how everyone did, parties, studied, and then after university, I kind of um, went travelling, um, did lots of other things, then I got a job. I worked in, uh, as a graphic designer for 10 years, and uh, it was great. It was just me and the computer, and um, it was e easy, you know, I just did my own thing. Um, then, 
after 10 years of working uh, as a graphic designer, um, I got made redundant. Um, but since that very moment, it changed my life. It changed the way. Um, so when I got made redundant, I was like, oh my God, what do I do? I don't know what to do. What shall I do? But I was really fascinated with working in the arts. It's something I would, I would, because I've always loved the art, um, I've always loved theatre, and I've always loved um, going to galleries, and that's something that I really wanted to do. Um, but, um, so I was uh, in a pub, drowning my sorrow because I was made, and I got no job, nothing, and I've just come back from America because I spent all of my redundancy money flying to America and, uh, and I got drunk every single night in America, in New York, and I came back, signed on the door, and then uh, I decided to go to the pub and I was drinking, drinking, thinking, what, what am I going to do, you know. But uh, then I met up with a friend of mine who introduced me to go to the riverfront, the riverfront in Newport, to, to work in the marketing department. So at that point then, I wanted to learn a little bit more about the art and started to learn a bit more about theatre, and, uh, and I loved it. It was great. Um, so I did that for a year, two years, getting to know about the art, but I really wanted to become a teacher. I felt that that's something that I really wanted to be. And I remember saying to my mum, I'm going to be a teacher. That's what I want to do. I want to teach art um, in mainstream education. My mum was like, no way. You could never do it. You could never become a teacher. And I found that really strange because uh, my mum always said to me, you could do whatever you want to do. You know, you play the guitar, you play football, you went, you did it, you did it, you've been travelling, you've done everything, you've done a lot of things. But I don't think you could become a teacher. But I persevered. I said, no, 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 I'm going to do it. did my teacher training. And um, so I said to my principal, is it possible you could put me in a school with a small class um, and they're good kids. No, he put me into Penny Drag, which is uh, in Merthyr. I don't know if you know Penny Drag, um, which is in Merthyr, and it's a buffet school in South Wales. Why he put me there? Because he thought I was fun and confident, and he knew that I would cope. So I'm standing there, 36 kids, there's a lot of kids, and I was really proud. I've done a really good visual PowerPoint, and I know I could do this, I could do it, I could do it. And I uh, did my PowerPoint, and then I asked a question to someone, OK, so what do you think about the, uh, the emotions of colour? The one kid put the hand up, said something. I had no idea what the kid was saying. I really had no idea what that kid was saying. And it made me realise at that very point, I'm deaf. I'm really deaf. Because all those years, like being in the private sector, working on the computer, talking to adults. I don't give a shit what they say. I can live with them. It doesn't matter what they say. But for a kid, you have to understand what they say. And I struggled because there I can't live with them. Uh, they don't speak that well. So at that point, at that point, You know, I couldn't not understand the kid. And I realised my mum was right. She knew, she knew that I'm deaf. I didn't know that. I thought I was just like a, a guy who had a hearing aid fitting in. But I didn't realise how deaf I was until I spoke to that kid. And then it got worse. I started having anti-anxiety. Where'd it come from? I could hear it. So the kid would do that. And then they would play Mr. Foggy on the phone or something. They know I can hear the sound, but I have no idea where they come from. So they, they're smart old kid, and they realised they could take advantage of my death net. It was awful. And um, at that very point, I wanted to walk away from the classroom and decide not to come back. But you know what? I spoke to my principal, and uh, my principal was saying to me, you know, only you could work out what you could do. And I thought about it. I thought about how can I do this, and I thought about a way of making teaching more exciting, but without actually having to use anything verbal. So I, I worked it out, I worked it out. So I, I did my own teacher strategy where I did, 
I spoke and nothing was spoken in the classroom. So I would have post I would have a whiteboard. In fact, the whiteboard wasn't that good because probably most of the kids would write a little cock on there or something <laughs> or, or um, but, you know, that's normal. Um, so I, I, I kind of like worked out a way of how we did because part of me think that um, my mum, I don't want to put my mum to victim here. She's not the victim here. My mum made me do, made me believe that I could do anything I wanted. So I, I, I had that belief that, yes, I could persevere. I could try and make this work. So I persevered. I, I tried to make it work. And um, so I kind of stuck on it with teaching for a while. Um, but it just got harder and harder and harder because it wasn't the kid. It was the teacher, because um, what the teacher had such a fast-paced industry, I had no idea what was going on. So I decided to quit. Story of my life, quit. So I quit teaching. Um, but then I kind of, kind, of, kind of slowly got back into working in the art again, because I was teaching and I was working, doing volunteering work at the Wood Fund. But I started to do a little bit more work in the art. Why? Because um, I felt comfortable working in the art. I also felt a little bit um, angry about the lack of asset for uh, how we look in the art. For example, not enough captioned, uh, Formated, um, the lack of using interpreted in the show, and uh, I used to go to non attackable performances because I didn't realise they had attackable performances. But I wanted, I felt that at the time maybe I should try and um, change the way how we look at theatre, and at the same time, change the way about me embracing myself as a deaf person. So I started to. Um, kind of find out a little bit more about um, my deaf identity, a little bit similar to what I was doing in university. So it's more about um, trying to understand what um, deaf culture is all about. So I went to Deaf Club, uh, Deaf Club, which is in, a card of Deaf Club, which is in Newport Road. And I walked in thinking that I could get on well with everyone. So everyone signed in, no one spoke. They refused to speak to me. No one would speak to me because I spoke. But yet, I'm still deaf, I'm still the same them. So again, I'm stuck in this kind of grey area. You know, I'm kind of like, what do I do? I don't want to be with hearing people. I love them, but they make it really hard for me. I want to be with deaf people because I feel more of a belonging with them. But yet, they won't have any interest in talking to me. So there's one deaf person there in the deaf club who was able to teach me. And he taught me in a way that um, you could learn sign, learn sign. So I learned sign. So I learned sign and um, I kind of, kind of, um, the more I was hanging out with deaf people, the more I kind of felt a little bit of a belonging with them. And it's great. And, um, but I'm 44 now. I didn't meet my first deaf person, well, other than the one in university, uh, which is when I was in my 20s. I didn't meet my first deaf person until about five years ago. So really, I kind of like trying to uh, catch up on about my deafness. And what, what, what's been really interesting is the open door between me and my mother. My mother always had no regret saying that she thinks that it was the right thing for me to do to be in the hearing world, that they were challenging for me. Um, but um, she never felt that um, she had to put me in with uh, a deaf community or, or a deaf club because um, she didn't think she wanted me to do it. And I think uh, at, a, at a moment, I just, I just recently became a dad, and I realised uh, how traumatising it can be to make those decisions. Um, um, so I started, to, when I, I kind of like uh, started to 
the more I would get into understanding a little bit more about deaf culture, the more um, I felt like I wanted to try and, and um, find a little bit more about myself. So, I have a show, um, and it's called Loud It's Not Always Clearer, based on the painting I did in 1993. This show here um, is a one-man show um, based on my experiences. So the experiences is um, it's about the way how I connect with hearing people and how I disconnect away from deaf people and how I try to, to bridge the two together. Um, why am I talking about this? Because um, I, I feel this is everything what I've just spoken about now. And I felt like I want to bring this up because um, to see how it became, how it developed and uh, how it came about. So I've just found out yesterday the show I'm having in Chapter was starting in two weeks, it's sold out. Great, five nights it's sold out. And, um, so, um, which is great. Um, and I'm touring all over the world. Um, it's a really um, big thing for me. I'm not an actor. I've never done any acting before. Uh, I like performing. Uh, I'm feeling good standing on this stage. I've, I've become the goody here for a long time. I've always wanted to be on this stage. <laughs> so, I do, so I feel good being on this stage. Um, I do like performing. Um, so it's a big thing for me because I want to tell my story. I, um, I spend most of my time as a consultant. I consult with theatre companies um, to try and to make improvements for assets. Um, sometimes go in there, out there. So what do I do? I do a show. So let's make a show about, um, about my, my story and hopefully that will get the message across. So I've come up with, um, based on the idea of um, using the painting I did in 1993 and making it into a show. How do I make the show? How did it come about? Um, we are all creative, always had all these brilliant ideas um, and then it's about trying to make that next step forward. Um, how do you do it? So, um, could you... So, um, I was really fortunate. I had an idea. This is my idea. My idea is what I just told you, about the story about this grey area, about uh, the deaf community, the hearing community. I was really fortunate to come up with uh, Natural Theatre Wales um, had um, uh, a project called Wales Lab. I don't know if you've heard of it, but Wales Lab is a very simple thing. If you have an idea, um, you could use that idea and you play. You play with this idea. So I um, had this idea had um, I wanted to do. Um, so it was one week of exploration uh, where we would explore, play games, have fun. So in that one week, I had two deaf actors, two hearing actors, and uh, all we did, we played. So we played with the idea of uh, what it's like for me to hear. What did it like for me to communicate with deaf people or hearing people? So, um, and it was a great week. We, we, did, we, we had fun, we did things, and uh, at the end of that week, we have a chair in, people come in and have feedback. In that week, I had a film production which made um, a film about the show, um, about this week. Um, and a, so. We're in the Shimon Theatre today and we've been starting the very first processes of Louder is Not Always Clearer with Johnny Cotson as part of a Wales Lab exploration, I suppose. I think it's really important that people need to overcome barriers about um, deafness. I mean, it's not about um, the sympathy toward a deaf person, it's about um, understanding and uh, it could be something that's like really beautiful. We're looking to try and give an audience an experience of what it is like to be deaf in, you know, in a world of sound. We all went to a cafe, and those of us who aren't deaf, we had earplugs in, um, and we all agreed not to use spoken language. Um, so that was an incredible experience of 
trying to get an insight into what it's like on a day-to-day -day basis. So for example, for me, it was a small thing when we were all sitting around trying to talk to each other. Um, I felt at times I just disengaged with some conversations because I found it too difficult. I don't think I necessarily do that with um, spoken language. I think keeping things simple and clear are obviously the key to this project. Um, but we have to kind of wade through what, what it's like to be Johnny, what it's like to be isolated and what it's like to feel some of the frustrations he does. And then how we might communicate that with an audience or, or get the audience to feel that. And that's, that's what we've begun to play with. I think the most important thing is definitely the human connection. Wow, uh, to be able to uh, look at those people in the eye and watching them, watching them move, and watching them feeling a bit awkward about it, and I definitely take that away. And I think I'm hoping the hearing people would take that away. And I think uh, it made me realise uh, how they are so disconnected with the human person. From that week, from that week, we explored everything very non-verbal. We looked at how movement can be translated across. From there, with the Wild Lab, I went on to do um, an r and to, to explore a little bit more. It was initially going to be um, trained actors to do that, not me. I was never going to be in it. But in the end of the R&D, the research and development, we all decided that I would probably be the best person to do that. Why? Because it's my struggle. It feels more natural for me to tell my story because imagine getting a human person trying to play a deaf person, it's never going to work. So we did an r and d a really good r and d um, looking at the way how we tell different stories. So a lot of stuff like a story that I used in my show called Stuck in the Dark. It's one of my biggest fears, not the stuff bit, it's having stuck in the dark. Why? Because light off. I need, can't see anything, so I need the lip read. So it's one of my biggest fears to be explored the way how, um, uh, you know, how can that come translated across? Because it's something that I'm not comfortable with. I have to have the light on everywhere because I need the lip read. So um, we looked um, at ways of um, karaoke. I've always wanted to sing. I never forget that time I had um, a German theatre that told me to mine. So, um, but. I know why I have the mind, but I've always wanted to sing. So in this show, I'm performing the chapter, I'm singing. I don't know if it's good or not, but I don't give, <laughs> a, I, I don't give a shit. But it gives me that opportunity to sing. Um, so yeah, so we kind of did that one week of R&D. I did a very small performance in uh, the Bioromantica Festival in chapter. From there, I went on to, uh, to do another track performance, and now I have this show. The show was starting two weeks uh, in chapter, then going on to Riverfront of um, 20 West Wales, then North Wales, and then down to uh, the Riverfront. Um, so, really, so everything that the experience I've had, uh, that grey area, it become, I've decided that to become a show. Um, I realised we're kind of maybe running out of time. Um, this is the photo from the track performance I did at Baromantica. Um, I kind of, I kind of used uh, a laptop because my asset is palatype it. So palatype it is a speech to text relay, so somebody would be my ear and they would type, and then I would, I would have it on the on the screen. Someone like Sammy, who's an interpreter. Uh, sometimes I have an interpreter, but I decided to go with the idea of being the palatype. So I would type, and then the, the word would come up. The, the play stuff very non-verbal, very lot of movement. Um, just to quickly wrap up, uh, I am a theatre consultant. I do a lot of um, deaf equality workshop. Here I have my own, I have uh, thanks to the support of Trim 5, I don't know if you've heard of them, uh, they work with a lot of disadvantaged 
uh, community to help them to overcome barriers when they go to theatre, to become up the idea of having a German deaf theatre club, because it's a barrier for deaf people to come to the theatre. So thanks to um, the funding of Chim 5, they uh, deported me having a deaf theatre club, and it's one of the biggest, um, we have one of the biggest audience for deaf people um, come to the chairman. We have deaf volunteers to come. Um, we, we do visual flyers. Um, I've, just, I've just recently completed a project for uh, um, Arts Council Wales, creating a, a guideline, a toolkit for how we make um, work more accessible for theatre. Um, that is I think it was published yesterday, um, so it's on the Art Council website, um, something that um, I'm really proud of. Um, it's, I'm really keen to expand that to other uh, areas like music venues, um, or, or creative places, uh, because they all would be a barrier for deaf people, and a lot of people have that fear how to talk to a deaf person. So this tool could there uh, explain how to work or how to communicate with a deaf person. Um, again, I do a lot of uh, workshops. Um, I, I, I decided to come up with the idea to have a hip hop workshop. A lot of people think deaf people can't dance. Deaf people can't dance, but we can't feel the bass. So let's have a hip hop workshop with a deaf guy um, and uh, it was really successful uh, because it's about feeling the bass and moving with the bass. Um, so this was a group of deaf people and non-deaf people working with a deaf dancer, um, working with theatre to help them to improve the asset. Um, yeah, and uh, I do a lot of work with um, uh, young people with um, got learning disabilities and uh, deaf, ch deaf people so these are just some examples of what I've done. Um, I think I'm kind of running out of time and I think that's it. Um, <laughs> I, I hope you enjoyed it. I'm sorry I'm a bit all over the place. I've got a little bit of a cold and flu but um, if you have any questions, if you've got time for questions, uh, feel free to ask. Thank you very Thank much you for listening. Thank you so much.